Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ted Ruger. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to a, an annual event uh, that celebrates uh, our connections, our many connections um, with, uh, with the globe, um, uh, both bringing uh, world leaders and, and, and important world figures here to Philadelphia, as well as uh, helping build connections and helping students and faculty uh, and connecting with alumni who work who are doing important work uh, on in human rights in the public sector and, and important private sector work uh, around the world. So, um, and, uh, and this particular uh, kind of keystone lecture is called the, uh, the Holt Lecture in International Law. Um, it began more than a decade ago. It was inspired by uh, a, uh, an alumnus uh, from uh, many decades ago, Lee Holt, who uh, made his career at a time when uh, it was much much more rare to think globally and, and to practice law and business globally. He made his career as an international businessman um, and worked in, in many countries. He, um, uh, he witnessed the, the kind of post-World War II melding of cultures um, through air travel and international trade. And uh, his own work took him uh, to deal with uh, lawyers and business people in dozens of countries around the world and recognizing that uh, certainly a, a great law school needs to connect its students and its alumni around the world. He gave back by endowing this Holt uh, lecture, which is an annual event, and uh, we've brought some really amazing people through to speak uh, in past years. We have an amazing speaker, Sandia Coro from the World Bank. This year, uh, I am going to uh, defer to my amazing colleague in, in a moment, Ranga to the Silva to always to more properly introduce our distinguished speaker, speaker but it is a great, Pleasure to, to welcome you here, Ms. Okoro, and, and uh, I, I, uh, I, like everyone else here, look forward to, to hearing your thoughts. Um, before I move on from Lee Holt's uh, great uh, connection with the law school, um, he was so connected that uh, his grandson went here, uh, and we, we are honored to have uh, Michael, Mike Weil from the class of 2012, who uh, works in Philadelphia today, and uh, thank you for coming, Michael, and thank you for your family's uh, uh, support of, of this part of our international programs. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so as I said, today we bring to campus a, a major figure who has worked actually as general counsel of, of, of some ma major private enterprise, which you'll hear about, but is currently uh, the general counsel and senior vice president of the World Bank, uh, one of the most uh, important institutions in the world at the intersection of government, banking, finance, law, human rights. There's, there's I'm sure not an issue you don't deal with, Ms. Okoro, and we look forward to, to hearing with all that. Um, um, behind uh, the formation of this lecture and uh, this year and, and so much of our uh, excitement and dynamism in our international programming is uh, our colleague, or my colleague, and, and well, our, our colleague, and for some of you, your teacher, uh, Rangita De Silva De Alwis, our Associate Dean of International Programs. Um, who has done tremendous work uh, both here at this law school as well as in many other settings on the rule of law and on, on human rights. Uh, she was a driver of the Global Women's Leadership Project, which provided research to UNESCO and the United Nations on the role of women's human rights around the world. She was inaugural director of the Global Women's Leadership Institute um, and Women in Public Service Project, launched by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, Harvard Law School, uh, her alma mater recently honored Rangita as a woman inspiring change. Um, she certainly inspires us. And uh, thank you, uh, Rangita. Thank you, Sandy Oro. And uh, I will turn it over to, to Rangita to more properly introduce our, our speaker. Thank you, Dean Druger. I want to start by, before welcoming Sandy Okoro and introducing Sandy, to really acknowledge the presence of so many women leaders here at Penn Law. 18 months ago, Sandy told me, this is the century of women's leadership. And I took those words really to heart, and I discussed this initiative with the Dean. And he supported me in launching a new course on women, law, and leadership. So I have very many members of the class here who are going to be your interlocutors. And it is really important for you to have that exchange with the next generation of women leaders here at Penn Law. 
So, Sandy, your visit here to our law school marks the 75th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Conference and the Bretton Woods Institutions that grew out of that conference, the World Bank. John Maynard Keynes and 63 other men led this conference towards a new global order and towards international development cooperation and multilateralism. 75 years later, and 189 countries later, the Bretton Woods Conference was convened 44 economies, so 189 countries, and 75 years later, Sandy Okoro is the first black general counsel of the World Bank. And Sandy knows that she carries on her shoulders the weight of this venerable institution and its history and its future. She knows that she is a symbol of change during a century of women's leadership, during an year that marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment here in the United States. And she knows that the symbol of change is about catalyzing gender equality and leading the legal vice presidency towards meeting and closing the global gender gaps, both in the law and in practice. And as a change agent, you have said, Sandy, that gender inequality is a man-made problem with a feminist solution. And you're an unabashed feminist. So this conversation today is based on two prompts. One is your own leader, leadership in the global stage, on the global stage, and then the ways in which the political economies of 189 countries are shaped by the global agenda of the World Bank. So it is both substantive, both political and personal. So there were three shaping moments in Sandy's life that really created turning points for her as a woman leader. And we in our class have studied some of those shaping moments. One is that in grade school, when she was an eight-year-old, her teacher went around the class asking each student to say and to share with the class what they would do when they grew up. And when it came to Sandy's turn, Sandy said, I want to be a judge. And the teacher said, Sandy, little girls, Little black girls from Belham do not end up as judges. You decided then and there, Sandy, that you would prove her wrong. And you proved to all of us, little girls, little black girls who came after you, that little black girls, their place was on the bench. Second, when you graduated from law school and you went to an employment agency seeking a job, in the city, you were told that your name, Sandy Okoro, was too ethnic. And you were advised to change your name to something more Anglo-Saxon. Because you were married by that time to somebody who had an Anglo-Saxon last name. And you said, no, you would not. And that was when you learned to stand tall. You went on to make history as a 25-year-old, the first ever black female director of traders, the first black woman general counsel of HSBC, managing more, more than $450 billion, um, in asset management. But the real turning point in your life was when you were asked to speak on a panel on the role of the general counsel, the changing role of the general counsel. And you were the last person on the panel, and when it came to your turn, everyone else had spoken about the changing role of the general counsel, and there was really nothing more for you to add. So you tore up your script and you spoke about your own life. And that was when you realized that you could see yourself and recognize yourself as a diversity champion. And you went on to build a career and an inspiring career as a diversity champion in the UK and around the world. And as a diversity champion, one of the turning points was when a woman in the audience came up to you and said that she had thought of committing suicide that afternoon, but that after you had spoken, she thought that life had meaning and that life had purpose. So you literally change lives, Sandy. And as a diversity champion, you know the real value of mentorship. 
You've been mentored by male leaders who literally and metaphorically gave you wings, right? Both given you their private planes to, to fly for the interview at the World Bank, as well as the wings to try new things. But you've been an amazing mentor for both women and men. You got involved in the legal launch pad, which is a program primarily targeted, targeting ethnic minority law students. Uh, run by the Black Lawyers Directory in the UK at Baddings. You co-founded the See the Possibilities mentoring program aimed at young students. Um, but, as I've told you this before, I think for me one of the most remarkable was the way in which you changed one of the most hallowed and iconic of British institutions. And it is part of what you and I talk about decolonizing the minds. It is that as a trustee of the Royal Shakespeare Company, both on stage and backstage, you made sure that more diversity was brought to the forefront. You love the stage, Sandy. And at the World Bank, the world is your stage. And because there are so many ways in which you're transforming the World Bank's legal vice presidency as a general counsel, which was very much a traditional, um, there was a certain orthodoxy about the general counsel's role at the World Bank, but you come here with your vision to transform both the World Bank and the 189 economies that you've created, and I'm going to choose just two initiatives, created two initiatives, and you talked about it earlier in the afternoon with the dean, a new global lawyers compact on the rule of law to elevate law, to bring, first to use the convening power of the World Bank to bring the lawyers from around the world, including our lawyers here at this law school, and their voices across the globe in line with the Sustainable Development Goals Rule 16 because that is all about law, justice, and peace. And uniting lawyers across the world is something that the World Bank can do. That is the platform that you are really mining and harnessing. And the second platform that you have created, which I think is going to be your defining and most enduring legacy, is the creation of the Empowering Women by Balancing the Law Initiative. And that is really going to be a major part of our conversation with our students here, where you've seen the data that has been collected at the World Bank over the last 10 years by the Women, Business, and the Law Initiative. And you've said this laughingly and seriously, that you have so much faith in data that if data was a man, you would marry data. <laughs> and, and you've used this data to tell a story, right? And the data is unfortunately dire. 104 economies do not allow women the equal opportunity to engage in the employment of their choice. 49 countries do not still have sexual harassment laws on their books. 59 countries do not have uh, domestic violence laws. In 18 countries, husbands can legally prevent their wives from working. 2.7 billion women are affected by unequal laws and economies lose 160 trillion in wealth due to differences in lifetime earnings. So if the World Bank just focuses on this project alone, I think the World Bank would have achieved its goal of creating not only gender equal economies, but economies that are thriving. And 28 trillion can be added just by changing the rules in the laws around the world. So empowering women by balancing law is a really visionary idea because you've taken this data collected over the last decade by the World Bank and you're using the convening power of the World Bank to bring together governments and other stakeholders to change the laws. And one of your first pilot countries is the Gambia. And in your office, exactly a year ago, I met with the Attorney General of the Gambia, uh, Mari Tambudu, and I told him that we would send a team of Penn Law students, a, a team of this law school to the Gambia. Yes, yes. <laughs> to, uh, to the Gambia to do a fact-finding mission. And so we are part of your mission and your vision. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sandy. And central to the World Bank's mission is the way in which 
women's economic participation and gender equality in the laws is a determinant of the economies of their countries. So this was really a turning point in the, in the World Bank and in your own journey as a woman leader. So just as much as you like the data, I like to look at the language of the laws itself, right? And because I'm with the World Bank, and the World Bank doesn't name names, I will also abstain from naming the names of these economies, although I would like to. But I, my, and my students and I have been studying these laws. A certain civil code in a certain country, and, and I like to name the code, it's 100, the section 178 of the civil code, requires the wife not just to respect her husband, but to respect the parents of her husband and relatives. This is part of the civil code of a certain economy. Article 257 of the civil code of another country, when a woman opens a bank account, every time she withdraws money, the bank must notify the husband. And in a penal code of a certain country, a woman faces a 14-year prison sentence for voluntarily miscarrying. And then finally, a superpower. A superpower excludes women from 400 categories of work. So your philosophy simply is, I am the general counsel of the World Bank, but I'm much more than that. I don't need accolades for the job that I'm paid to do. It is the work that I'm not paid to do that matter. And never forget what you're hired to do and then do much, much more. And the Women Empowering Project is the doing much, much more. The work that you're not paid to do, but the work that really matters. So what I want you to do now is just speak briefly about the work that you're paid to do as the general counsel of the World Bank. And you have said that it is, you know, you run a huge team, a team of lawyers from around the world, and you give legal advice and make sure that the bank is compliant with the articles of the World Bank. But I also want you to speak briefly about these two new initiatives that bring a new vision to the World Bank. And then I turn over to our interlocutors here to ask you further questions. Thank you very much, Angita. And thank you all for coming. And um, can you hear me all OK? OK. Um, and uh, it's nice to see all of you. I love coming to events like this and meeting with the next generation of leaders, both male and female. Um, it's very important to see what you're going to look like um, when I am retired <laughs> and to see uh, what um, the future looks like. Um, first of all, I want to say it's such a delight to be here because this is, goes to show what female friendship and the female connection can bring. So when Gita and I met about 18 months ago, we hit it off like that and been firm friends ever since and talk about so much. What I didn't know until just now was that I had inspired her lecture uh, series. So uh, that's great to know. It's something to add to my CV. <laughs> um, so um, what can I say about my day job? Um, one of the things, and I think I'm going to get a new mic. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought you couldn't hear me. Is that better? Yes. You, were t you weren't telling the truth when I said, you're just being polite because a lady's come a long way and she has a British accent. Um, so um, I am incredibly lucky to do the job that I do. Um, I think, first of all, as a lawyer, because I always wanted to be a lawyer, you heard that story. I'm not a judge yet, but who knows, there's still time. Um, but um, I, so I feel incre incredibly privileged to have been able to have a great education, to use that education to do a great job, and now be in a great uh, position, and to be fair, a position of influence. Um, I'm very aware that there are so many women in the world uh, that have greater brains than I have, but have not been able to use them for whatever reason. And um, whenever I travel around the world doing the job that I do, um, many women will come up to me and say, can you be our voice? Can you be... Um, can you help us? Can you help change things for our lives? Because they see me, I get out of a big UN vehicle, lots of people surrounding me, and they naturally think I have this influence. And you know what? I do. And I have to remember that I do. Because look, I'm sitting in front of you right now, you know, and um, I can help be that voice. And for me, when I heard that, it made me carry on doing what I've always done, which is 
to speak about things that are bigger than the job that I do. Um, uh, Kristalina Gregorieva, who was the CEO of the World Bank before she went to be managing director at the IMF, that's how many great women we have at the bank. They go and do other great things elsewhere. Um, always said, what's the point of, of having a big job title um, if you don't do something important? Um, and so I have my day job, and my day job is to manage a big team of lawyers. I have 172 lawyers, um, and they're spread across the world. Um, we deal with all the legal matters that affect the bank, and I'm actually general counsel for the World Bank Group. I'm also a senior vice president, which means on occasion, um, I might have to step in and act for the president when he is out of the country. And I've had to do that three times in my job there in three years. So it's a very big job. It's a very important job. Um, I have to advise the president, management, um, the board, uh, you name it, all the different organs uh, in the bank. Um, we have uh, a member of our uh, administrative tribunal at the bank. I won't, I won't embarrass you. <laughs> um, and I also sometimes on occasion have to give advice to the admin tribunal on administrative matters uh, to do with the bank. So there are many organs of the bank that I give advice to and my team gives advice to and then I have to manage them with 72 people and I am the um, spokesperson on all legal matters to do with the bank. So a pretty big portfolio. But one of the things I'm always asked to do because I am the general counsel, not because I'm Sandy Okoro, but because I'm the general counsel, is to come and speak at things. And when I first joined the bank, um, as a new general counsel, I was asked to give a speak at um, ASIL, which is a big uh, conference that they have. I joined in February. I think I gave it around March, April. And um, I was given a range of topics I could choose. And I said, no, I'm going to choose my topic and I'm going to talk about what I usually talk about, um, which is um, something to do on gender, and I talked about domestic violence and domestic violence laws around the world and the effect that, you know, if the, if the world is not a safe place for women, we are not going to get any progress in this world at all. As soon as you make the world a safer place for women, they can contribute from their families, for their communities, for their countries, and so we have to kind of deal with some of this gender-based violence. So that was the theme of my talk. Um, and um, so it was a very different talk. I don't think it was the talk Aza was used to hearing from a general counsel. I got a standing ovation, and some people, which is lovely when you get a standing I'm not saying you have to, I'm not saying you have to, <laughs> but I'm just saying it's lovely. Um, but what, what, what um, some people did come up afterwards, uh, mostly the men, actually, and said they were moved to tears. They didn't realize how much violence women face in this world. Um, and there were some women who came up and said, well, thank you for talking about it. I have been a victim of domestic violence. People did not, not me, I mean, someone said that, um, came up to me and said, I've been a victim of domestic violence. I didn't want to talk about it. I was felt shameful about it. You've given me the ability to talk about it. And so, again, that said, I have to talk about these things. I have to use this platform, A, to try and change things in this world and make this world a better place for women, to talk about the changes that need to happen, because that is within my role in the bank, actually, because we do work with our member countries to make those changes if they want to make those changes. Um, and then secondly, also to, um, well, thirdly, really, to promote the rule of law. Um, because without the rule of law and access to justice, we don't have to be in this room. There's no point, really. This is what we're all here for. I think everybody joins the legal profession at some point because they have a real feeling for justice. I was like that. I grew up at a time when apartheid still existed in South Africa. And even though I was in London, I was on the streets marching for the end of apartheid, and I saw it. And now it's probably difficult for many of you to believe that ever existed in this world. That in a, a particular country, you couldn't vote and you couldn't live in certain areas because of the color of your skin. But it did exist, and it ended because people fought against it all over the world. So I grew up in that very sort of activist time. Um, and so that's still within me. And what I have done in my role, as Rangita mentioned, is try is set up two things. We've done a number of different things with my team, this is not me solely, but with my team. Um, empowering women by balancing the law and this global compact. So empowering women by balancing the law. The idea is to work with our member countries. We have 189 member countries at the bank. That's virtually every single country in the world, bar a few. And to work with them, they come to us and say, we want to change 
the laws on our books that discriminate against women. And we will work with them to do that. And we will analyse, we will get the laws actually changed, and we will um, do some lessons learnt and move that forward in a cultural way, in the way that we can. Not just the bank, but working with the UN women, working with uh, law firms, working with whoever we need to work with because of that convening power Rangita mentioned. We are quite unique in that convening power. We can bring other people to work with us. Our main aim at the bank, as I'm sure you all know, is to lend money to our member countries for developing for development projects. But changing access to justice, rule of law, is a development issue. So we can lend if they want to borrow to change those laws. But first of all, you need to analyze the laws. First of all, you need to have a discussion. So we're using that convening power to try and convince these countries this is money that is worth borrowing. It's worth borrowing money to change these laws because of the impact it will have in their countries, the impact it will have on e economic growth, the impact it will have on the lives of every single person in the country, not just women. So we are um, moving forward with this initiative. Gambia is the first one. We're working with one of the big global law firms who for free are going in to analyze the laws. So this is, this is a lovely sort of confectionery of um, different um, stakeholders and actors and countries working together to make these changes that really will change people's lives. But the law is a, is a, is a foundation for this. You, you change the laws, you don't take, change cultural norms. But you know what? You don't change cultural norms without a foundation of the law saying, you can't do that to me because the law says you can't. So 100 years ago, or around about that, in the UK, they changed the laws that allowed, uh, could, could allow women to enter into the legal profession. And we're celebrating that 100 years at the moment in the UK. And, um, but without the law changing to allow women to do it, women would not be doing it. So we've got to remember the law does play an important part, and at some point laws need to be changed to move that cultural change forward. The second thing we're doing is we're doing this global compact. I love easy ideas, easy peasy ideas come to me all the time. Uh, that can have a big impact. And this one is we're getting, we're working with the Law Society of England and Wales, and we hope to work with many other law societies and bar associations to get all the lawyers, including all of you in this room, to own SDG 16, Sustainable Goals 16, which is about peace, justice, and um, strong institutions. This is the lawyer's sustainable goal. If you do not believe in the rule of law and access to justice, you're in the wrong room and you're in the wrong profession. And we need to own this, because this goal everybody wants to meet by 2030. We all play an important part in making sure this happens. And I think there is silence from the legal community on this. So I want to bring that up to the front. And I want to hear people talking about SDG 16 and rule of law, and because it leads to peace. Rule of law, when you have a good rule of law, you tend to have more peace. When you have a breakdown in the rule of law, you tend to have a breakdown in the peace. Um, and um, Martin Luther King's famous quote that is in Washington, D.C., um, is uh, along the lines, I can't remember exactly, but uh, peace is not just the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. And I think that says it all, peace equals justice. And that's what we are here to do, and that's what we are here, and we're part of that justice system. So bringing together all the lawyers through this compact, law societies, bar associations, lawyers in private sector, lawyers um, in um, uh, uh, in-house teams, wherever they are, wherever the lawyer is, to bring us all together as a community to say there is there are two values we have, which are access to justice and rule of law under SDG 16, I think is really important. And it would be great, wouldn't it, in time, that if this is talked about in the same way we talk about climate as being important to every single person on this planet. Because there isn't one single person on this planet where rule of law and access to justice is not vital. Maybe if you don't ever have to use it, congratulations. But when you do, you want to know it's there. It's like the parachute. Okay, you don't want to jump out of the plane and then check to see if it's there. You have to have it, and it's, it's a necessity. So that's, those are two of the things. I went on for a very long time, I apologize, yeah, so but I, I want to go to questions. So I want the, the legal scholars here in this room also to feel that they're part of your exciting mission, Sandy. And I want to remind all of you that 25 years ago when I was in law school, only 45 countries had domestic violence laws on their books. And today, 25 years later, only 45 countries do not have 
domestic violence laws on their books. So although that is still a travesty, I want, I want the students here to understand that change can take place in their own lifetime. And what you're trying to do is to accelerate and to scale up that pace of change, because the pace of change is slow. So and on that note, what I want to do is we have interlocutors in this room who have read both about your own leadership journey and your leadership philosophy and the theory of change, but who've also really delved into the women business and law um, reports. Every year, my class reads the annual report, and we see how slow the change is. And we look at the seven indicators on you know, job placements, domestic violence, family law reform, and look at how access to bank accounts are not the only indicators for economic change. It is the domestic violence laws. It is guardianship laws. It is access to property inheritance and land that also play a determinative role in growing both women's economic participation, but also their countries and their economies. So Eduarda, who has been both studying the business and the law, 2008, women business and law, 2018 report, but who's also been doing some work with me on studying Ethiopia's legal system and Ethiopia's law reform for, for UN women and UN women's work with you, has a question and she'll start first and then we have 11 more questions for wow. Sandy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I was a part of Professor Rahida Dikola's uh, Penn Laws, Women's Law and Leadership Lab, where we analyzed uh, the underrepresentation of women in leadership and law and business, and we developed policy and strategic imperative that could equalize the playing field for women. Um, as she mentioned, we also read off about the launch of the Women, Business, and the Law 2018 report in July. And you applauded many successes, but also gave an important message on what gender equality and women's e economy empowerment means. And you mentioned the strides made in Latin America and also mentioned the lack of agency, violence, early pregnancy, and more that are also limiting women's access to success, to business, and equality. Um, so again, in our class, we learned the difficulties of these things being women's issues. Um, I was wondering that even though there is a basis that women's equality is good for the economy, increasing GDP, good for the family, and just overall in general, how do we get countries to change not only their laws, but their practices to truly empower and support women? Thank you uh, for the question, and, and a great question. I'm sure the other 11 are going to be <laughs> just as fantastic. Um, so I'll have to answer quickly if I've got to fit um, 11 in. Um, just one thing I wanted to mention I forgot before in terms of things that we are doing um, that are outside our day job. My team, not me, but my team in their spare time have produced four compendiums about different laws. It's compendium on child marriage, compendium on FGM, female genital mutilation, domestic violence, and we're about to bring out one on sexual harassment. All it does is list the laws in all our member countries on the books that deal with these issues. The rest you read in between the lines. So you can see if there are laws on the books or not, and if that, there are laws on the books, then you can see if there have been any, um, how many cases there have been, or, or, or how, they are, um, how these laws are uh, actually used and implemented. But you, so to kind of answering your question, producing compendium like this helps. Because it does actually start to change attitudes and it starts to change um, actions. And what it does more than anything, it gives CSOs and NGOs information they need that they don't actually have at that particular point in time. So when we launched a domestic violence compendium, um, we launched it at the bank, we had um, a number of um, local NGOs and international NGOs and CSOs come that dealt with domestic violence issues. This information was gold dust because they could use it and they could say, you know, they're at the, it, it's very important if a woman, women don't come saying this law has been broken, okay? And, and in many cases, we don't say this, is my, this law has violated my rights. You come and say this is my problem and someone tells you, you have a legal right to X, Y, and Z. So people do not come with the legal problem. But what is really useful is when they say, you know, there's a law that says he can't do this to you. That is really useful. 
And I have been to many women's refuges in many of the countries that I go to. When I go on mission, I make a point of going to see women that have been survivors of domestic violence. And their stories are very, very similar. And one of the key stories, going back to the laws, is that one of the reasons they stay for longer than they should or can't get away is access to their children. And if there are laws in a country that say you cannot have access to your children, you cannot take your children out of, your, of the country, or even you can't pass your nationality on to your children, when you are then subject to domestic violence, you don't have the same choices other people might have. So even this law over here to change may look like it has got nothing to do with domestic violence, but in fact it has, because it's about women's empowerment and then their economic empowerment that gives them choices. And we have data at the bank, so that's one thing. Is, is producing information and data. As I said, if data was a man, I would marry it. I'm loving it. Lawyers don't usually like numbers and data, but actually it, it backs up what, you're, you, know, what you need to say. Um, the other thing that's quite, um, I think, important is gathering data. And so Women Business in the Law is not produced by my team. It's produced by another fabulous team in the bank. But this has encouraged countries to change those laws because we rank them. And like anything, people want to go further up in the ranking. And that's a good thing when it comes to changing laws that discriminate against women. But the ability, and this is what, where the bank is really clever and um, the economists there are really clever, is able to rank. Um, and the doing business report is another thing. People want to go up in the ranking. Some people are really, some countries are really not too happy when they are lower in the ranking than other countries. But you know, these are facts. These are based on their statistics in their countries. So we, they can't really, the data doesn't lie. Um, so uh, these reports mean something. And the more we do of them, the more that actually countries see where they lie in relation to other countries and what they need to do to improve. So it may sound dull, but I think this is really important because you need a basis and a springboard for this change. And some countries, and again, I won't name them, have seen how badly they're doing on me and have actually come to the bank to change practices and laws through borrowing to, to, to make these changes. Um, so I think those, these sorts of things are important. The other thing I think is that we do have to kind of work as well, and we're doing that in the bank with the private sector, because the private sector can have an awful lot of influence in um, every single country, and they're really big global international com companies now, I'm sure you can all think of them, that are, have the same footprint we have, and that are in 189 countries. There are certain brands, wherever I go, I always see them. No matter how remote an area I go, I always see them. Um, and we, we talk to many of them, um, and it is, how can we work with you to improve um, some of these uh, issues? So um, I'll give you a very simple one, mobile phones, for example. Um, mobile phones you will see even in some of the remotest areas. Not everybody will have them, even when electricity is really bad. Instead of three, in one phone, people have three phones, so when the electricity, you've got another phone. So people do have access, not everybody, but it's one of the things lots of people have access to. But when it comes to domestic violence, sometimes women's phones are taken away from them. And so making sure that actually you encourage, if you're a mobile phone company, women to have access to phones or giving women access to free phones or whatever it is, or even various charging that might be different for women are the ways the private sector can help. So I think there are many, many levels. Data is important. Um, um, you know, encouraging uh, countries to want to change, because you, you know, we're not in colonial times where we say you have to, it's you, you want to. Um, and I think some of these global initiatives, like we're trying to start and getting the conversation going, and getting the conversation going with the local law societies and those organizations that locally on the ground can talk about these things are very important. But linking some of these issues to poverty and lack of economic growth are really important too. I hope that answers your question. So that really links to the next question on fin women's financial inclusion and mobile money. So, uh, uh -huh. yes, <laughs> and so Lindsay will do a good job on broadening some of the issues that you raised on the ways in which mobile money and financial inclusion are linked and the ways in which women's legal rights are a matter of a development priority. 
So I was also in the Women Law Leadership Seminar this semester, and we have the privilege of meeting with Natalie Chibonwe, who is the CEO of EcoCash, Africa's largest mobile banking app. Um, and Natalie told us that simply by moving routine cash transactions into online financial accounts, several hundred thousand Zimbabwean women were able to move into the retail economy from primarily subsistence farming. Most of that was because they were able to keep cash away from their husbands. Um, according to World Bank data, though, women remain vastly overrepresented among the unbanked in most economies. Mm -hmm. How do you think that the World Bank can use fintech to alleviate the gender gap in financial inclusion and meet women where they are in terms of access to financial institutions? Thank you. Um, so uh, technology um, is, a, is an important, uh, it's going to be, technology and artificial intelligence are going to be an important tool. Uh, dealing with some of these um, issues. So uh, last week at the bank, we have Law, Justice and Development Week that we have every every week in November. And our, our, we focus on technology and we always have a gender um, section where we look at this. Um, the, 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 before I answer how it can be used, the challenge uh, that technology brings is it can leave people far behind. Um, and so even before you start with anything from a technological perspective, you have to ask, and how does this impact women? Will it, will it work in the same way for women? Because when you're dealing with communities that have some catching up to do, then the women are catching up even to that point where the catching up is required. Um, so, um, and I'm not an expert in the tech field by any, in, any means. But I think um, what we do at the bank is with any project, we mainstream gender issues. So we always work out in any of our fintech projects what, how it's going to impact women and how we can improve women's access to those projects. But what I would say is let's not think that everything is at that level technology from a tech. There's some low tech stuff as well that we mustn't forget. And when we talk of women, we mustn't forget young girls as well, because they grow up into the women. And let me give you, which isn't really answering your question, but it is an interesting answer, is um, a low-tech example. So in uh, one of the countries I visited that has a high degree, because it's a post-conflict country, of sexual violence against women and young girls, going to school if you are a young girl is dangerous. It is dangerous. And so um, what we did at the bank was it's called a walking bus and a really simple idea that you got a few parents together and they picked, up num they picked up children on the way and you can imagine this sort of snake of people going and that was the walking bus. So the children were accompanied to school and were safe so young girls could not be picked up. But that wasn't the end of it. When they got to the school, they could make sure the teacher was there. Because sometimes in some countries, teachers don't turn up and teach, which we take for granted here. Um, but sometimes in some countries, that's a challenge. So that was one example. Another thing going slightly further up, but still staying with girls in education, uh, is a mobile app we did, and I can't remember the name of the country, called um, Eloikov, which was parents could then, uh, in the app, kind of report and this was a different country, where, where the teachers had turned up for school or not. And that reporting went through to the sort of central agency that dealt with teachers in schools. And that meant that actually, guess what? The teachers started turning up because they weren't going to be paid if they didn't turn up. Before that, it was very difficult to get that information back in a reliable way. So low-tech technology, the use of a phone, the use of an app where people could report, also meant that children were getting a better education, and therefore girls were getting a better education, but also teachers were teaching, and safety issues. Now, the other thing when it comes to women and banking and women and money um, is that um, there are, as well, many maybe laws on the books that are challenging in that area as well. So even if you can start your own business, can you keep your money? Um, also, inheritance laws can stop women from um, inheriting um, in, in, a, in a way that you would think would be fair. Um, even so, in some countries, um, if a woman's husband dies, she doesn't inherit. It goes to the next male member in the family, who could be the son, <coughs> but it could be um, a, a, the husband's brother if she doesn't have any male children. Um, that 
can be an enormous issue when it comes to uh, women's economic empowerment. So fintech can help, without a doubt. And as I say, I'm not an expert in that. And there's the low level and the really high level. But I think what we've got to remember with all of this is women's access to it in the first place. Can they keep it? Um, and can they use it to further not just their rights, but the rights of other women as well? They, 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 um, and it, you know, it's not just a women's issue. It's not just a women's issue. We, we talk about it in terms of women. But women um, have important roles to play in households. And those households have young men in them. So women are really, and I think there's a lot of study on this, the educator of boys as well as girls. And you educate a woman and you give her economic um, empowerment. You are also educating that boy in that household too, to a better level. So to think it's only women you're helping is just wrong. And I remember we ran this competition a while back and uh, we had a young man who, it was, it was on domestic violence and we did a sort of writing competition in one of, the, one of our country offices. And they had to write about their experience of gender-based violence. And two young men, um, so about 10 people won the competition. They came over to DC, and two of them were men. And they talked about their experiences watching their mothers being beaten up by their fathers and the effect it had on them. So we've got to remember, it's not just the women we help with this, it's the men in their households too, which is therefore every single man in the world, really. So the fintech... Um, is just, I think, just one aspect of making like, women's lives better. But not to the extent we leave them farther behind. And we bring some women forward and leave some of the poor in rural areas behind. And, and that's, that's, that's the real challenge. But at the bank, we try and make sure that doesn't happen in our gender-related by mainstreaming. So the next question is from Kumaya, who has a shared ancestry with you, Sandy. Uh, she's also Nigerian ancestry. And Fumaya wrote a paper in my class on unequal <laughs> inheritance rights, uh -huh. looking at Nigeria as a case study. But she also did an independent study with me on World Bank's project on ID4D, uh -huh. the biometrics and the ways in which the gender, gender aspect really complicates ID4D, both yeah. has both negative and positive implications. She and Michael work together on many issues and are working together on several studies that they share. So they have four questions that they've come up with, and so I'm going to ask Humaya to start. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it's such a privilege and an honor to be able to hear your experiences. Um, so one of the things we got to do during the semester in the Women in Law and Leadership Lab is talk to a wide range of women in positions of power and leadership. And we really wanted to make sure that our interviews were not sterile, but took into account their various identities and how that sort of influenced their philosophies as leaders and power movers. And so I just wanted to know how it was to grow up. We've heard a little bit from Professor Rangita's introduction, but what was it like for you to grow up as a Nigerian in London? And also, how do you balance your different allegiances to the many facets of your identity as a woman, as a woman of color, as an immigrant, and as an African um, in your leadership roles? How does that play into your philosophy as a leader? Do you, want, you want me to add another question? Yes, so Michael is of Cuban ancestry, so he also brings a very interesting multicultural approach to his work and to the classes. Well, I actually have um, a shorter question related to the World Bank's work. Well, first of all, hi, I'm so sorry. I should have said Hello. thank you for being here also. <laughs> um, appreciate you being here. Um, so I did want to ask one short question, which is whether or not, and I'm not familiar, if the World Bank does any sort of outreach for countries that are not members, my country being one of them, Cuba, um, I'm curious, I, I guess, how you envision the role of the World Bank to non-members in the future. I think there's a possibility for change, at least for my country, so I'd be curious to hear about that as well. Thank you. Uh, great questions. Um, isn't it? They're both on their phones with the question, here I am with the notebook. <laughs> <laughs> it says everything about the different generations, isn't it? <laughs> um, so, let me take your question uh, first. But before I do so, I just realized I want to create correct something before it goes into myth and legend, because this is very important, particularly in this climate time. 
I didn't take a private plane to my interview <laughs> at the World Bank. I love Rangita's um, retelling of that, that story. But what did happen was that um, when I got the job at the World Bank, I was working um, uh, at uh, Bearings, which is owned by Mass Mutual, that has a big, um, a, a big sort of facility, their head office, their headquarters in Springfield in Boston. My boss, who was one of my mentors, my ultimate boss, who was one of my mentors, Mark Rolig, um, was so pleased for me. He always told me I, the job I was doing was too small for me and I should think bigger. And he's actually sent me Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, to read, because he thought I wasn't leaning in enough. And when he heard I got the job, he said, right, you're coming to Springfield, and, because we want to celebrate, the CEO's private helicopter will pick you up from Logan Airport and take you to the facility. So it wasn't quite a private jet all the way from London to DC. It was a, it was a teeny weeny helicopter uh, instead of a five hour journey to uh, the facility. Um, but he was a great mentor to me and he wanted to celebrate my success. So to your question, um, so growing up, my mum was from Trinidad and my dad was in Nigeria, but I was born in London. So I had a whole panoply of different sort of cultural things coming left, right and centre. Um, and the, the cultural aspects of a Caribbean society, very different from an African society. And then you, you're right in the middle of, of London, which was not as cosmopolitan then when I was growing up as it is now. And um, when my parents first arrived, there used to be signs on the doors in London, it's famous for it. Uh, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. So you were, it was, everybody saw those signs. Um, and you just grew up, it, it, was, it was part of that, uh, uh, that time. Um, so I grew up in an atmosphere where the world was changing, those issues were changing, but they hadn't changed yet. Um, I think it did me the world of good. Um, it, I think it's given me the ability to fit in anywhere now, because I'm sure anyone who comes from um, you know, a background at home where the food is different, the language is different, you know, you're one person there with your aunties and your uncles who seem to have to play a part in your life. You know, that differentiation between your parent, you know, with my kids, um, I'm a single mum when it's really just me and them. I think you don't know how lucky you are. I had about 12 parents who all had a, a, an idea on how I should dress or do things. You know, that, that huge extended family. Um, and, um, you know, you have a little bit of that different world in your home when you walk in through the door. But sometimes when you're growing up, because you always want to fit in, that's the thing, when you're growing up, you want to fit in, you find it really annoying and you don't want anyone to ever see your parents, really. Um, but everyone is the same, you know. Um, but, then, but you don't realize the, the richness that gives you and the experiences that gives you. Um, and let me tell you a story. So um, I always loved my surname um, and I thought it was so super special until I went to Nigeria and I found out it's a bit like Smith. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, my father was an Igbo because no one was called, you couldn't, there were no, we used to have things called the phone book in London and I would look every now and then to see if another Okoro came when you got a new phone book. There were like four in the whole of London and my dad was one, it was so cool. Then I went to Nigeria for the first time and said, I know, everyone's called Okoro. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm nothing special. Um, but because the name was always, it was always different, it was always, uh, to some people, unpronounceable, I loved it. So when um, I was going uh, through my career, and Rangita sort of told a bit of this story, and I was told, why don't you have an Anglo uh, name, you know, because my surname at the time, well, my surname could have been Hopkins, because I was married to Mr. Hopkins. He's gone, he wasn't up to the job, but there you go. Um, <laughs> ladies, when they're not up to the job, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> moving on. Sorry, gentlemen, I'm sure you were all up to the job. None of you will get moved on, I'm sure of it. Um, in fact, I can tell you right now, you will never be moved on, so do not worry about it. Um, so, but, um, so she said, why don't you be Sandy Hopkins? So much easier. And I'm thinking, okay, first off, if they're not going to employ me because of my surname, they're certainly not going to employ me when they see me walking through the door, right? Because it's not the surname, is it? Let's face it, you know? Um, and so why, why, why go and work for someone that doesn't want me because of my surname? Let me go and work for someone that uh, does. And I was, also, I was told then, well, you'll never work for any traditional British institutions with a surname like that. So I went to work for Schroders, which is one of the most famous sort of merchant banks at the time, Bearings, which was very famous. I then worked at HSBC, I was on the board of the RSC, I did some work for the Premier League. 
go figure. That was not a really good piece of advice. But when I got the job at the bank, and they do this, all, this announcement, President Buhari yeah, of Nigeria sent me a personal note of congratulation because <laughs> he said we keep track of the Nigerian diaspora. So even though every second person in the part of the country that I'm from is called Okoro, they knew that I was definitely from that part of, it's a bit like having the name like, oh, like McDonald's, you know it's kind of from a Scottish origin. So isn't that an irony? that actually what has happened now, your authentic self, keeping your authentic roots, is a big part of who we are today. It was not when I was starting my career, but I thought, well, it's going to be now, and I just don't want to lose that. So after all that, oh my God, my parents are so embarrassing kind of thing, you actually absorb all of it and it becomes part of you, and makes you a richer person. To your question, sir, on Cuba, we, in our articles, it says we can only lend and work with our member countries, so we're tied by that. But let me just say something. We have 189 member countries. We started with way fewer than that, something like 40. So there's always been a point where someone is not a member country, but we're looking at when they're going to become a member country, how that is going to happen. Um, but we have to be right, we're politically neutral, so we have to be careful of the politics. But how do we get from sort of 40 odd countries to, I'll tell you two very interesting stories. One, um, the end of the colonization. Um, so, where, so where someone, for example, like the UK, was a member, it was UK and all the colonies. So you didn't have a lot of these other countries that you have now, like Nigeria, like Trinidad and Tobago that my parents are from, okay? But when decolonization happened in the 50s, they all became member countries. So that, that boosted the number. So after we were created to rebuild Europe after the Second World War, when that had happened, the next thing the bank did was um, post-colonial countries and, and, and uh, building them up. Then, when that was done, what was, oh, guess what? Soviet uh, bloc fell, and another load of countries joined, and we worked with them. So there's always something happening. So right now, at 189, there are very few that are not members. It's their choice that they're not members, people can, can join. So I don't know when Cuba is going to become a member. I don't know if they will become a member. But at any point, any of these other countries that are not a member, and that we will always be working with them ahead of that to make the entry smooth and, um, but one thing to remember is you cannot be a member of the bank if you're not a member of the IMF. So that you have to hit the IMF hurdles first. Um, so we do not have and we cannot have any countries that are members of the bank that are not members of the IMF. Because the bank was almost an afterthought when they created uh, in the Bretton Woods. They created the IMF first and thought, oh my goodness, we need to have an institution that can go to the market and borrow money, etc. So let's create the bank. So this afterthought has turned into a big, you know, monolith of itself. Um, so, but, but that's the way that it works. So because I'm sure that President Buhari or his successor will be writing a letter to Pumaya so. when she becomes... An iconic leader just like you, and that is one of the reasons why we have leaders, global leaders here, because we want our students to travel in the trail that you've blazed. So I'm going to ask her to ask her second question once we go through her classmates, but on your point, Michael, Sandy and I have been talking about writing a paper on decolonizing minds, right? Because that's really part of decolonizing yeah. nations. And um, on that point, we have Sharon. Sharon, who is going to ask a question on political identities of nations, nation states. Hello, Hi. thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so I had a question, as an international actor working in other countries and within other cultures, how do you balance a vision for gender autonomy and empowerment with the different perceptions other people may have of what's best for them and their country? Great question again. Um, as I answer these questions, I may go back to previous things that have jumped in my mind that I forgot to say at the time, so excuse me for that. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, we have to respect um, the cultural norms, the political identities, um, the political systems of our member states, and that is mandated in our articles. Um, 
For very good reason, we are not allowed to make lending decisions based on the political affairs of a particular country. It's in our, it's in our articles. I'm a lawyer. You don't need to be a lawyer to read that, but sometimes that's not as clear. What does that mean? And that's a lot of work that my team does in terms of advice. Um, but going back to the previous question, when we do these reports and these rankings, countries want to improve. And the economics are there for themselves. And so when we started, so the bank was one, uh, kind of at the forefront a couple of decades ago of recognizing the issue of gender and that gender inequality um, has an economic impact. So they were, I'm not saying they were the first, but they were one of the first to connect gender inequality with uh, economic growth and impact, gender equality with the success of companies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, now we talk about that uh, as something that's second nature. I think for many of our member countries, they recognize that this is an issue for them if they don't start to play catch up because they're not going to catch up with the states next to them, uh, the states uh, um, around them or wherever it is because every, everybody wants to keep their talented youth in their country. Okay? You don't, and I mean, many of you may be from countries outside of the US who've come to study. There's a possibility they've lost you forever. Or there's a possibility you will go back. But they're hoping you're coming back. I mean, they're even hoping I'm coming back. <laughs> Hence the letter. Um, <laughs> um, but keeping your next generation of really talented people in the country, in some countries, is a challenge. Because wonderful institutions like this will come and offer them something fantastic. And then when they're here, another offer comes along. And then something else comes along in their life. And before you know it, they're not coming back. Um, so part of that as well are the systems and the cultures in the country in that if you feel there are better opportunities for you somewhere, particularly if you're female, you may not go back there. So I, and the world is becoming very global in that sense. And there are other players in the market who offer. You know, traditionally it was sort of like UK, America, France that people went to. Now it's places like China too. So there are so many choices out there for people that actually for countries that are developing, the next generation, and they have a better ratio of younger people than we do in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so keeping your youth for the next generation really important. So you're going to have to change some of those um, laws and rules and traditions that are not actually in alignment uh, with the expectation of your young people. What's really different today? The mobile phone. Okay, um, We were talking about this earlier. Not only does it connect people, but it also shows you what other people's lives are like. Some of it isn't true. You know, some of it is like a Photoshop selfie or whatever it is. But some of it can show, I mean, the Arab Spring was a really good example. That went viral um, through um, social media. Um, so you can see how other people are living their lives. You can see the opportunity. So people are now challenging some of their norms in their countries. Access to challenging it and to send information is also easier. It's an impressive a button. Um, so if you think about some things that are very cultural in nature, such as female genital mutilation, which is prevalent in so many countries in this world, it's, people will say it's a religious thing. Firstly, it's not a religious thing, it's a cultural thing. Okay? So many of the imams have said it is not a religious thing. Okay? It's a cultural thing. So if it's a cultural thing, therefore it can be changed and you're not really stepping on anybody's toes uh, in a way that um, is inappropriate. So spreading that message, and I have a couple of friends uh, back in the UK who do a lot of work on this, is really important because FGM is planned poverty for women. You, you, it happens to a girl when she's really young, then it means she's out of education because she marries young, and then she has children young, and that's it for her economic empowerment. But spreading this message, spreading all these thoughts that you can, is really important. And so that change of political identity, I think, has to come from within. But the way it comes from within can also come from outside at the same time. But we have to be respectful of political boundaries, of borders, of different cultures. But you bring people along when people see that there's something in it for them. Keeping your youth 
more votes? Do you want the women's votes in your country or not? You know, these sorts of things are really basic but should not be forgotten. And I think that um, when we look at some of our member countries who are really looking to tackle some of these changes, and there's some um, amazing world leaders out there now who are saying, I want to change the life of the women in my country. However difficult that might be from a political standpoint or from a cultural standpoint, they are the visionaries and the change agents. And even though these are women's issues, right now it's the men in power who can help with that change. And so we need to work with them too to realize this is good for their country, this is good for them, this is good for their families. But at the same time, remembering that for the West, it wasn't that long ago where things were that different. So I remember when I was growing up, m my mum my wanted to borrow, I think, money to buy a car or something like that. She had to get my dad to sign the loan form. She couldn't borrow money on my, her own. My dad could borrow money on his own, but she had to go and get my dad to co-sign the form, even though she was working and had her own money and her own bank account. And I'm, I know I'm old, but I'm not that old. Um, so it's not that long ago that things like this have changed. It's not that long ago that some of the laws we're looking at in some countries, like sexual harassment laws, did not exist in some of the countries now that are saying you need them too. So the gap is not as big as you might think in terms of time, but in terms of cultural march, it's quite quite big. Let me. Ju I just want to say something about biometrics, and I know it wasn't your question, but it was in that area. We had a biometric for LJD Week. We had a biometric mirror. I don't know if any of you done a biometric mirror thing. You stand in front of it. Um, it's supposed to show the cultural biases, and it does a little sweep of your face and then tells you things. So um, <laughs> I did this, and it started off quite well. I went in, it said female, tick. That was the result. Next one, it then said age 31. I thought, I'm loving this mirror. <laughs> I want one at home. I want one in every room. <laughs> and then it went along, and then it said other things that, that I was not so happy about. So it said attractiveness, low. <laughs> I thought, I think this mirror is broken. <laughs> then it said weirdness, average. Then it said responsibility level, low. Right? And I'm the general counsel of the World Bank, right? So responsibility level low is not good. <laughs> but it made me think that these things are being used more and more. They could be used more and more in job interviews. It's not good, really, because it's, not, first of all, a lot of that was not true. And the age was true, but the rest of it was not. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of it. So we have to also be careful with some of these things. Because um, even, I, I now have the new Face ID phone. Okay. Um, it opens when I don't want it to open, and my 18-year-old son is there, and there's stuff on it that, you know, because uh, it's the World Bank phone that, you know, it's, it, it, every time I look at it, it opens, <laughs> and stuff pops up that I'm thinking, no, I don't really want it to pop. You lose a little bit of control, and apparently, you can just wave it in front of someone's sleeping face, and it will open. Um, so there are great things, but there are other things in some, some of the biometric stuff that could be great for women, in terms of giving them more access, but could be bad for them as well. We did a hackathon for LJD Week with young people who were, the youngest was 13, they were all high school age children from all over the world. India, Mexico, Bulgaria, South Africa, and I forget the fifth one. But they, they all came and they did this hackathon and they had to invent an app um, that had a legal angle to it, but also kind of a justice angle and various things. Uh, Tunisia was the other one. So Tunisia won the People's Choice Award, so people voting in the room. They created this terrific app, which if you were being attacked and it was aimed at women, you press the volume button twice, it automatically sent an alert to the police station that you're being attacked with your location and took a picture of the perpetrator. So, um, you know, to answer, I'm sorry, I'm going back to your question. There are so many things that we can do. Um, but we need to get young people involved as well in this um, and to come up with the ideas and, 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 to, and for young people to be engaged back to your question in their nation and thinking they can play a part and they can make a difference is really important because that's how you get the groundswell for change and that's when people come to the bank and help us say, how can you help us make this happen? So Christiana Callan was a non-law student in my class on international women's human rights. She's from Sierra Leone, and she's a doctoral student here at the university. And her own thesis in her paper was the importance of the intersections of law and cultural change. And
and she brought this very important perspective to a class that was mainly led by law students. So I think this is a good segue for you to talk, uh, Christiana, about some of yeah, your own. Thank you so much for being here. I echo what all my colleagues say. It's really great to just see you. The visual representation is just as exciting. So as Mandela says, it's impossible until it's done and you've done it, so thank you. Um, like uh, Professor Rangita said, I was not in the law school, but I was really interested in the intersection between law and culture, and then specifically localizing and setting norms. So in an, a past interview, you did say that, you know, law for you was where the power was. But so many people don't have access to the law or knowledge of it, uh, particularly women, particularly minorities. And I'm wondering, what are kind of your recommendations on localizing some of these larger international and domestic laws and having it really be a grassroots le uh, movement where people can then embody it and advocate for themselves? Um, any thoughts on that or any initiatives that the World Bank has really done to localize some of these international laws? Um, another, another great question. Um, it kind of goes back to a bit uh, of something I was saying earlier, that often when people have a problem, they don't link it to a legal issue. Um, so um, if somebody comes and takes part of your land in a rural area, or takes some of your cattle, whatever it is, you just think someone's taking my cattle. You're not necessarily, and I need it back, and how do I get it back? You're not necessarily always thinking in legal terms. But even if you were, and you're thinking, right, I need to go, because uh, I have a civil action here, they trespassed on my land, blah, 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 blah. You might be 600 miles away from that court system you need to access. It could cost you a whole month's wages to get there, and then it's going to take you five years to get anything done. Which is why customary law is so popular in some places. And so instead of doing all that, you go to the village elder, you get it sorted, and it's sorted then and there. Um, so that may sound great, but it's not usually very great for women, because customary law it has a huge gender bias, usually. Um, and uh, even when you're dealing with some serious issues, such as sexual assault or incest or whatever it is, again, you, know, you can't access the court system that's hundreds of miles away. You go to your customary law, and that is the solution that really you, you can get. So I think one of the challenges with all of this is there is, in many places, and in rural areas in particular, in many of the countries we work in, customary law is often the law that people are turning to. The problem with customary law, it's not necessarily evolved the way that civil law has evolved, with changes and changes to the law and changes to interpretation and precedent, etc., etc. So, But it is still prevalent. And customary law uh, can often give, particularly with inheritance and land, favor to a particular uh, community or gender or whatever it is. So people don't want that change. So whenever we're looking at that, I think we have to look at which law we are talking about. Is it the customary law or is it the civil law? And not to assume that customary law is a bad thing. Because when you, so, to, to, I, you know, you might think the answer is just get rid of customary law. But then you're not giving people access to anything because the access to the civil law is very hard. So I think what we need is to think about both, really, and to think about at a local level, how can customary law be evolved to match and to give, um, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to dispense some local justice quickly and not dismiss it necessarily? How can we train... How can that be coded, etc.? Because until the civil law can be dispensed to everybody everywhere, then get it just saying that that is not, um, you know, applicable would be problematic. The other thing, I guess, is the use of artificial intelligence and how that can help. And again, sort of technology is that you know there's a tradition that you go to court. Okay, and I'll give another low tech example. You go to court. The court doesn't come to you. One of the projects the bank has done is this mobile court that I went to see in Tanzania. Loved it. It's a van. It's a van with files in it, and a magistrate goes in the van, and you book it online, and they come to the village, and then they do all the cases in the village, and then it goes again to the next village. Right? 
Really simple idea. But when has a court ever come to someone? Usually you have to go to it. And then it's very formal. But this idea of um, you know, the law coming to you and you having access to deal with some of the, the more routine, and most people's cases are more routine in nature than the really big, big ones. So has been really helpful in dealing with some of these customary law issues. And guess what? Women are the biggest users of these services. Um, so I think the use of that, that's not artificial intelligence, obviously that's a low tech one, but you can see that extrapolated into artificial intelligence in that um, you know, if you can access at a higher level things that are more complex, the judges don't have to move, they don't have to go through, because sometimes roads are not great, it could take a long time to get a short distance. If you can access through artificial intelligence some of these services, um, this will be another uh, an, another um, great thing. Um, but I, I, and I do mention the customary law again. We mustn't forget this is very strong. It exists in many areas, and we have to think how we work that in as we move forward with the civil law. Because until you have a system whereby that is accessible to everybody in the same way customary law is accessible to everybody, you will leave a lot of people behind and they will still turn to the customary law. So I don't know how you digitalize that. So in our joint project, um, Eduardo and I have been looking at policies in Ethiopia that disallow women from registering their uh, land yeah. along with their husbands because they cannot afford the, the transportation to the city to register their land. So even when the law was changed to mandate that both men and women, both husband and wife, must register for land and land tenure, women were not able to do this. And now through their mobile phone, they're able to register their lands from the village. So those are very kind of very practical but visionary ways in which we can make women's access both to justice and economic empowerment uh, freely available. So on that, as I said, we are going to pass, you know, we are going to go, you know, look at both your own personal journey as a leader as well as women's leadership in the global economy. Lauren Alters has a question that is very personal to you. Okay, I will do, and thank you for that. Um, just one other thing, sorry, I did say I would flip, is um, birth registration mm -hmm. is another important thing mm -hmm. that can happen a long way away. I am going to answer a question, I promise. That can happen a long way away. Um, and so sometimes, because the cost of getting to where you need to register the birth and the time frame you need to get there, lots of people go unregistered uh, in villages. Um, and um, this is a real issue because when you're unregistered, then you don't exist. And um, if you have something happen to you, you can't prove it's happened to you because you don't exist. A really simple one I was given an example when I was in one of the countries I visited was uh, a young girl was uh, raped and she was, um, I don't know, she was, I don't know, 10, 11. Um, she couldn't prove she was 10, 11 because she didn't have a birth certificate. So it's a different crime if it happens to a child than it is if it happens to an adult. But she couldn't prove she was a child. And these simple things about not having a birth certificate matter. So again, technology can help with that. If you can do it from the phone, and you need one person in the phone in the village that can send something through, or the birth certificate van comes every week, whichever way, high tech, low tech. But these things really matter for access to law further on. Now to your question. Um, the sort of intersection between the job that I do and me as a person kind of thing. Is that it? Yeah. Is that generally it? How have I, how have I done it? Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, do you know, I, you, you're hearing something about me in the way that you want to hear it, but I've lived the life, so it seems really ordinary to me. And I've lived it one day at a time. It's taken a long time. So when you hear the story, it's very truncated. Um, but I think that, for me, resilience has been the one thing, okay? 
It doesn't matter what happened. I still got up and kept going. You could call it stubbornness. <laughs> um, because when someone, almost when someone tells me I can't do it, it's almost like, mm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give it a go. Um, but it's been amazing how many things people have told me I couldn't do that I have done. Or would not be possible. It's not because I'm a unique person. It is not because I'm a wonderful person. There are way cleverer people and way braver people than I am. It's just that I was so dogged, I did not give up. And um, uh, Rangita knows the story. So I have this ring that has a stone missing from it. Um, and um, the stone kept falling out and falling out. And it was upsetting. Um, and one day it fell out again, and I thought, you know what, I'm not going to replace it this time. I'm going to, this, I'm going to use this to remind myself that life is not perfect, but it can still be really good and it still can be really shiny. So every time I look down, I'm going to remember it's not supposed to be perfect. And later that day, I was walking with my son and there are these guide dogs for the blind here and you put money in them um, to collect money for uh, people uh, who have problems with their sight. And he was small at the time and the stone had fallen out, lots of other things were happening. And I was really irritated and I was saying, come along, come along, let's go. And he was standing in front of the dog and he was going, oh, bring it on dog, bring it on dog. And I'm thinking, you're a three-year-old and you're having a fight with a plastic dog. And then I suddenly thought, wait one second, how many plastic dogs am I having a fight with metaphorically when making my problems bigger than they actually are? And if I just thought they're all plastic dogs, I can handle them all and I can just say to myself, bring it on dog, I can deal with any other, I want that on my gravestone, bring it on dog that um, I, I can deal with anything that's thrown my way. And I decided at that moment that was going to be true about me. Anything you threw at me, I could deal with it, and I wouldn't even break into a sweat. That was a mental choice. That was the reality I chose for myself. So a lot of it, to answer the other side of your question, is that for me, I made a mental choice about how I could handle certain things. And I would always be able to handle anything. Even if I had to think about it overnight, and there's a really good tip. When you don't know what to do, sleep on it. The answer does come to you in the morning. It is actually true. Right? I say this to many people in my team. You don't know the answer, go to sleep. Guess what? You'll think about it in the morning. You don't have to always react then and there. But you may have to react at some point. But remember, whatever you do in your reaction, it's your choice. Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, when he was in the uh, concentration camps in Germany, and he realized that those that had the best chance of survival, of which he was one, that thought they could survive. So if you think you can do it, you will be able to do it. But if you think you can't, then you won't. And it's that simple. And I just thought, I'm deciding I can do it, and there isn't anything I can't do if I set my mind to it. But there will be things I choose not to do. And remember, it's always a choice. That's all I can tell you. So I'm going to ask Sarah to wrap up with her final question. And because Sarah is going to conclude for all of us, I also want to share a very personal story that you shared with me, and I have your permission to share with uh, the, the Penn community here, that when you, um, at a certain moment in your life, you face major personal crises as well as political crises. And one of the major, I think, turning points in your life was when uh, you know, your daughter was diagnosed with autism. And at that same moment in time, you were divorcing your husband, or your husband had asked you uh, to separate, and your father was diagnosed with cancer. And I just want the students here to understand how your resilience and how you can rise above all of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you surrounded yourself not only with your own personal philosophy, but with your friends. Mm -hmm. And you know, one something that you shared with me yes. was that your best friend told you, until Prada comes up with a straight jacket, you're not going to go crazy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because your love of the law and, and fashion. And fashion. <laughs> Together. So on that note, I'm going to ask Sarah to conclude for all of us and to you have a good memory. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. Um, uh, as so many of my peers have alluded to, the Women's Law and Leadership Lab was such a pivotal class for us because it focused on women's views, women's perspectives, and put them at the forefront. And for most of us, it's the only class in law school that will take that will do that. Um, and this sort of goes off a comment that you made for International Women's Day last year. You said that this is the century of women. Um, so it's very helpful to have you here tonight and see what this looks like. So thank you so much for 
sharing your personal narrative with us. Um, so my question on that regards something else that you said, empowering and mobilizing women to take on roles beyond the family space, whether that's in the community, in the government realm, or in the public life. Um, I think we can all agree that most people would support that view in theory, but I'm wondering what you've seen done to operationalize that from a systemic level, a policy level, um, in that regard, to actually take this theory and put it into practice. Um, another, another great question, and thank you for, thank you for your comments. Um, so, uh, I, I personally think it's really important that women get into all spheres of life. Um, I had the privilege yesterday of meeting a group of congresswomen from Brazil uh, who all had great personal stories but were now in leadership positions in, in government. Um, and I realized that um, we need to see women in all areas of the life um, that we lead. So um, the law has always been relatively quite well represented by women um, at the entry level but not necessarily when you, still, when you get right to the top. And we really should have 50-50 in everything. Very few women in the media. So the way women are portrayed is not a women's view of, of women. So there are very few media moguls, there are very few women who run newspapers, etc., etc. So there's so many, and broadcasting, there are so many parts of life that we don't have very good female representation. Um, so I think that has to, has to change across the world. Um, to your question about how at the bank would we operationalize things, I think there's some very sophisticated answers about how we would operationalize it in our projects that can be quite detailed, and I talked about mainstreaming gender. But one really crucial way is to send women on these projects so other women see other women, right? Because when I turn up and I get out of the UN vehicle and with my name, no one knows who it's going to be. When they see a woman, it's like, oh. <laughs> and then all the women you can see, and you can always tell the woman who is going to be your friend on this visit because she's going to talk to you. And there was one little girl that followed me around, but I couldn't see. She was behind me. I did not know until afterwards. She was right behind me. And I was going to a new... Um, sort of uh, work we had done, electricity in the village. And she was right, well, the whole time, and every time I turned, she and she didn't want me to see her, but it was filmed. And her grandfather said she had never seen a woman in a leadership position like this. Get, she'd seen loads of people get out of the vehicles. She just wanted to check I was real. <laughs> um, and so that was extraordinary. So I actually think, and we have some women engineers on projects, we need to send our women on these projects, we have terrific ones in the bank, so they can be role models for others. Because you said it, the visualization, you're there, you see it. That's the biggest inspiration. And just to wind up, because I can see Rangita right here <laughs> saying, nye, nye, nye. just to wind up, because I'm the only thing between you, dinner and drinks, is that, um, uh, so I'll make this quick is that last, last week at Law, Justice and Development Week, we had Ahmed Ashkar mm -hmm. talk, and he said something that I will never forget. In the realm of things that young people need, anywhere in the world, in my view, it always started with education. He said, no, it starts with inspiration. Mm -hmm. And the inspiration, man, woman, boy, whatever it is, with someone you see doing something, you think, I can do that, I want to do that. And he is right. It starts with inspiration. Without that inspiration, it doesn't lead to the education. So I think, I'm sorry it's such a simple answer, but sending great women out on the projects to anywhere because they're the best one for the project is the most best way you can operationalize it. Um, so first of all, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'll say for myself, I know for the whole crowd, we've, we've learned so much. I'll say for myself, this is the most uh, interesting, intellectual, edifying, um, and calm hour and a half I've had in some times. Thank you. It's a tremendous, I, I learned a lot. Um, I'm going to rem remember the plastic dogs thing. Uh, so, But I actually have, a, and I thank uh, Rangita for your leadership with this and all the students for your really tremendously uh, sophisticated and intellectual questions. I have one last quick question. It's not sophisticated or intellectual, but it's important for, for this group. Um, you would be fabulous to work for and work with. How does how would somebody uh, come work at the World Bank? What oh, kind of question. how big is your legal staff? Uh, okay. okay. How, how big is? Okay. 
I can answer that question. See, I, I'm not shy about asking that. Like, how big is your legal staff? What stage do you recruit people? Okay, and where great do you question. recruit from? So, so first, from Harvard Law School, right? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> sure, law schools for sure. <laughs> I, 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 I don't have favorites in terms of law school. Um, but first thing, pass your exams, please. Because right, it's a really important thing, right? Pass your exams and do really well. Because you're not in the game of coming to work in the legal team at the bank or anywhere in the bank if you don't have a good education. So pass your exams and do really well. Um, we don't. We usually like. We don't usually recruit anyone who has any less than a master's degree or JD. Um, we we used to have a program where we, we could we, we, a young professionals program. I don't have that anymore. But so we so we recruit at all levels. Um, you have to be passionate about development because yes, you're a lawyer, but you're a development lawyer. Uh, you have to be passionate about our mission. That's a really important thing. You want to have to make the world a better place. You need to know something about the world as well. Okay? You can't just want the World Bank on your CV. looks great. But you've got to know something about the world and feel passionately. And maybe have done something okay, that, that indicates that. Um, so more, more than your lawyering. Okay? Maybe you've gone to one of the countries we're in and have done something it doesn't have to be amazing. You could have done something here as well. But you have to, you have to, um, you have to have that passion. So good education, masters or JD level. Look on our intranet.